love Danny Joe and Jazz ladies out there. This is your boy Satchel also broadcasting live from the cabaret in the sky. And when I'm not busy doing my soloing on my two horn, I just tune in to the Olympics presents We All Be News and Radio. Oh, yeah. The Mississippi White Citizens Council is exerting tremendous economic pressure upon the Negro people of the state of Mississippi. This pressure, coupled with the physical violence that we're having to endure, has worked a real hardship. It is our understanding that it is the plan of the Mississippi White Citizens Council to exert so much economic pressure upon the Mississippi Negro that 500,000 will be forced to leave the state because of this pressure. Today we have 986,000 Negroes in the state of Mississippi, but if they are able to carry out their purpose within the next 10 years, we will not have half this number. Uh, to be change agents, by knowing one's history, you know, Marcus Garvey, to paraphrase the great Marcus Garvey, uh, people without history is like a tree without roots. So it's so important to know uh, not only where you're going, but where you came from, where you've been, uh, what sacrifices have been made uh, for your progress and for your opportunities that you have today. And Dr. T.R.M. Howe is definitely one of them giants who showed us that we are standing on and definitely very much grateful that he ever existed. But Dr. Linda Beto, is one half the powerful dynamic duel. Her and her husband, Dr. David Beto, uh, wrote this very wonderful book. Once again, it's Black Maverick, T.R.M. Howard's Fight for Civil Rights and Economic Power. It's a must read. I, I got the book a couple weeks ago through Amazon.com. I could not put this book down. Um, I got through it within two days. The only reason it took me two days is because I had to go to work. But I very much enjoyed the book. And without further ado, I want to bring on Dr. Linda Beto who's also the professor at Stillman College in Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, I believe. And we're about to go to the airways. Dr. Beta, are you there? Yes, good evening. Uh, good evening. It's an honor to have you on. Welcome back again to We All Be Radio. Uh, talking about your wonderful book, uh, Black Maverick, T.I.M. Howard's Fight for Civil Rights and Economic Power. I'll just start off and say, uh, what inspired you and your uh, husband, Dr. Beto, David Bader to write the book about T.R.M. Howard. We were doing research in the Mississippi Delta and finishing another project, and everybody kept asking us about, have you heard about this Dr. Howard? And we said, no, we haven't, and we started looking for information. And I think the first we came across were articles uh, from the Chicago Defender, and -hmm. then we found out he was in the news all over during the 50s, and once we got started, it was just, you couldn't let it go. He was a brave man, flamboyant, wealthy, entrepreneur, started a lot of businesses, put people to work, um, encouraged civil rights. He was really a great man. In fact, we wouldn't, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, I'll, I'll, go ahead, we we'll definitely will talk. I was going to say, um, he is somebody we need to know because everybody have heard the names like, Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer. Well, it was Dr. Howard who mentored them. He got them started in civil rights. Uh, Immediately after college, Medgar started working for Dr. Howard. Dr. Howard had an insurance company, the Mutual Life Insurance Company. And Medgar would go from door to door selling insurance and get people to vote, register to vote. He got Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer in his civil rights rallies. He would have big rallies in the state of Mississippi that would bring in 13,000 plus people mm. and into Mount Bayou, which is an all-black town of um, the Mississippi Delta. People like Mahalia Jackson would come to sing. Third Good Marshall would come and ride in parades. And these rallies drew Fannie Lou Hamer. So it was Dr. Howard who got her involved in civil rights. I was just amazed when I read the book and you mentioned all you mean you just doing all this name dropping all over the place. 
And this guy seems like he's right out of Hollywood, out of Hollywood feature length movie. I mean, this guy seems too good to be true. Like he's like one part of Benjamin Franklin to me, one part of Indiana Jones, uh, and one part of this everything. He's a true maverick as far as his uh, his reputation, you know, in the book of the title. The title of the book implies he is a true maverick. And I'm trying to figure out. I keep on when I was reading the book and all the great people you just mentioned previously. I kept on thinking to myself, why is he not remembered better uh, by by history? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is um, his first love was medicine. He was a surgeon. So he, he would work on people and help them and heal them. So he would do the civil rights work, but then he'd go back to medicine. So he didn't stay in civil rights. That didn't define his entire life. He believed he was a realist. He believed in hard work, improved education, and the practical application of Jesus Christ. He felt like instead of sitting around making speeches and complaining about what the white man is not doing for us and blaming the white man, he said, lead by example. He was too busy making changes, getting rid of racial grievances, running um, boycotts. He had signs on bumper stickers, don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. And he put the white people in a, a hardship when people stopped buying gas. They started losing business. So guess what? They put in bathrooms for blacks. So he felt like we should be about the business of making a change to help ourselves. And this is actually when he was doing the uh, boycott of the gas station. Was this before the Montgomery bus boycott? Yes, it was. Uh, this was before Martin Luther King, but... Um, Charlie, this was before um, the Emmett Till murder in 55. So he had a successful boycott in Mississippi before um, the Till murder. Once um, young Emmett was um, lynched and the murderers got away, he stepped in. And he even was invited to Alabama by Martin Luther King and gave a speech. And uh, Rosa Parks heard it and she said that Four days later, after the speech, she did the refusal on the bus, refused to go to the back, or really refused to give up her seat. And she said that she was thinking about Teal at that time. So we know that how it had an impact even on Alabama. Um, he was a brave man. He protected those people in Mississippi during the trial. Um, Mamie Teal Mobley, you know, Teal's mother. He protected her even... Um, Chicago Representative Dawson stayed at his home. Mm. And um, he was just a wonderful resource. He believed that more people was involved in that murder. And as you know now, they're saying that he was right. And also, ways, um, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was, uh, no, I was saying, a lot of ways, he's the reason why we know about the Emmett Till murder at all. Well, he is because um, when it happened, not only did he go around speaking about it, um, after the trial, he went on a, a crusade across the country. He even did letter writing to J. Edgar Hoover. Why is it that you can find some down plain on a Colorado mountain, but you can't come to Mississippi or to the south and find out who's killing our blacks? And uh, J. Edgar Hoover wrote back, wrote him a personal letter. Matter of fact, he kind of gave it to the news ahead of time to catch how it all started. Mm -hmm. and said that uh, it's because of us that, you know, the Ku Klux Klan is not lynching like they used to. And Howard said, no, that's not the case. It's because we have fought against it and stood against it so long that the attitudes have changed to where the Ku Klux Klan is not, you know, um, popular any longer. So he argued back and forth with J. Edgar Hoover about what the FBI should be doing that they were not doing. And that took a lot. Um, he was on a death list, the Klan death list. They had him number one on the list. Hmm, wow. And you didn't figure out his, and, uh, Go ahead. No, there, there, there are a couple of things about him that really stand out. One is he didn't tell the line. He spoke truth to power. He mm -hmm. spoke truth to the evils of segregation. He stood for um, integration. He dressed, he was an immaculate dresser. 
He believed that he should hold his head up and walk like a man, and he didn't step down for another man. And I think young men can look to that, you know, to be proud of who you are and to create a life for yourself, to get up and go get, go get your career, go get your betterment of life, rather than just sitting around blaming and complaining. And he didn't do that. He didn't sit around. He got up and he, he felt like he should lead by example. 